I think we can uh, we can talk about this just for a little bit because this has been another, and we'll probably do another one of Mr. Regal in Japan. But I, one person that you wrestled uh, quite a bit, um, you know, you wrestled a lot of different people, but someone you wrestled in tags and singles with uh, recently announced that they were going to retire and was going to retire. Yes, sir. Mr. Muda, as a fan, uh, that's really uh, a lot of our first entry into Japanese yeah. wrestling was seeing that guy, and that guy was special. He was uh, yes, something he was. else. Can you talk a little bit about Muda uh, wrestling him? Uh, right. The impact he's had and, and how you feel about his retirement. So the first, in the late 80s, they started to, to show WCW in on ITV in England. And it was at about, it changed times, but in, in the Northwest area where I lived, TV's broken up into different areas in England. ITV comes, is the head banner, but it, it was when I lived in England, broken up into certain areas. Well, in the Granada area, which is the Northwest, which was covered Manchester, Liverpool, Blackpool, and all the Northwest Lancashire of, of, of England, uh, covered Lancashire, um, WCW, whatever show they shot, they put out, um, was shown between two or three o'clock in the morning. And <laughs> I was usually coming back, well, always coming back from a wrestling show. So the only people that saw WCW at that time were the occasional wrestler, maybe me, a lot of doormen that I knew because all clubs had to shut at two o'clock right? and loads of insomniacs. <laughs> so that's my, that was my first introduction to the great motor because he was on at that time. So I'm like, wow, this fellow's got a presence about him. And then he disappeared. And the only thing I ever heard about him was, or saw about him, because I used to get the occasional Japanese magazine. Then I came to America and it, you know, I knew he'd been in WCW and then different, whatever else. And then I got a Japan and I'm, I'm on with him. And I've mentioned this about UWF and Aki. Yeah. When you were walk in a room and somebody has a presence about them that you just cannot explain. It's like a movie star. Muta had that presence. Chono has that presence. They just had something about them. That you're going, wow. I get why everybody, not only that it's got nothing to do with it. Yes, they're inc incredible wrestlers. And they've got all three of that I just mentioned have an incredible skill set. But, but that personal magnetism. It, it didn't matter if they had, it wouldn't have mattered. There's a personal magnetism, as you just so eloquently, uh, eloquently quoted. There's a personal magnetism about them that just capture, captures your imagination. And so from day one, I met Muta. Oh, right. Oof. And so I, d I don't, cause I know, and it's not, a, a, this is not a, something I'm, I'm spilling here. This is a, a normal thing. His knees have been shot since I knew him, which would have been 1994. I might, I'm not sure if he was in WCW when I was there in 93, but his knees have been shot because of all the moon salts and landing on his knees. And he's been put together and he's gone out and he's been Muta or the great Muta and managed to keep an incredible career. I have nothing but admiration for that because my career was over when I was 45 because of a neck problem. I've got a bit of a suspect knee on the right right knee but it's not my actual needs the tendons are always stretched but it's still that didn't stop me wrestling every night how how he's kept going all this time and still kept that mystique about himself and 
be as good as he is and adapt to the times. I'm, I'm, I'm happy for him. I'm sad in a way sure. because his, his career has got to come to an end or at least he says it, he says it. It's, it's wrestling. It's wrestling. <laughs> yeah. But now he's older than me. So, I mean, I'm 54, so it's, what's it going to be? I don't know what his age is. Nothing but the best um, wishes for him. And then okay. what, one nice memory I, I have, I have great memories of always being around. When I worked in New Japan, I loved being in New Japan. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, in the early 2000s, w WWE we went to Japan for the first time in a long time. And I was, Pat Patterson asked me to go on first. And I had already finished my angle, right? What was going on with Edge? But me and Edge were on first. And he said, You, you know this audience, don't you? Because we're not sure how the audience is going to react. Right. Because they'd heard, conf yeah, you, you, yeah, conflicting things about how Japanese audiences are. You know, a lot of times they're very polite and just clap. Sometimes they stamp the feet. Sometimes they're vocal. And it's depending where you go. Every, every used to be every every place was different. You just adapted to it. No, no problem for me. Can you go on first and and make sure everybody's right? I can honestly say that was the the one night in my life. Me and Edge both know this, and anybody that was there. We went out first and there was nothing followed us. I rung that audience out that night. We both, well, not me, we both rung that audience out that night. I, it didn't matter because I knew how to do my stuff there and I did a different, and I actually go back and never watched the matches with me and Edge from when, when I was asked to first wrestling. Very more of a Japanese influence to him because I knew what they wanted to get out of him, which was to make him look like a tough guy. And he'd been in the tag team with Christian. And so I went out there specifically and whether they all look now for more than they did at the time. If you go and watch them now, you go, oh, wow, they were doing stuff that nobody in WWE was doing at the time, the way we were doing it. But I, my orders were, can you go and make this guy look like he can take a beating? And I did, and he hung in there and then he moved on it. And I was laid out to me. He's going to move on to such and such and such and such. I was the first rung in the ladder of making him into being the star that he was. He became as far as a singles competitor. And the Japanese audience, uh, love that stuff. So me and him, had, we just, we'd wrestled each other that many times in the last few, whatever amount of months. You know, you see what you see on pay-per-view, but we were doing loads of live events together. We went out and we rung that audience out. Well, on the front row was Muta. And I got out the ring after the match and I just walked over to him. And because we were all rivals and people in, in Japan knew that, he stood up and I shook his hand and people just cheered loudly. And I just walked out and left the ring to edge. To, so Edge could get the major, the main, the main uh, uh, which is my job is not to take anything from me. It's to leave the the good guy and to get the 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 accolades, the applause, the accolades. That, that's the word I was looking for, and leave it with that. But I went over and shook his hand. He stood up and we smiled at each other and shook his hand, and that was the last time I saw him. I think that was two thousand one. Well, this sounds good for him. The, and, and as uh, Mr. Muda's career uh, ends, as ends another episode of the Gentleman Villain Podcast with Mr. Regal. Mr. Regal, this was another great episode. And, of course, we want to thank all the people that work on the show, from Wesley to Steve to Dominic to Derek. Thanks, uh, fellas. Dave Green and Conrad, thank you guys so much. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you out there for listening to the Gentleman Villain Podcast with William Regal. Thanks.